it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rike Rees Naisborg. She is our Tucker lichenologist and also the curator of the lichenarium at the Botanic Garden. There aren't nearly enough lichenologists in the world, and we're fortunate to have one of only two in California uh, here at the Botanic Garden. So welcome, Rike. Thank you very much, Denise. Can everybody see this twig? <laughs> Can you see what's growing on this twig? Can anybody tell me which species it is? <laughs> no, I didn't think so. It's golden eye lichen. And, and you may not believe this, but this is actually the average size of a lichen. Of a lichen. So you can see we're talking tiny things here. So lichens, they're tiny and inconspicuous, and yet they provide some amazing ecosystem services. And therefore, I think lichens, they're nature's undervalued secret service agents. Before we dive into it, I want to give you an overview of what I'm going to be talking about. What is a lichen? Then I'll talk a lot about lichen ecosystem services. And finally, I'll touch on why that lichens are rarely considered for conservation. But I really want to make sure first that we all know what a lichen is. Traditionally, lichen has been thought to consist of one fungus that was associated with one green partner in symbiosis, and the green partner could either be an alga or a cyanobacterium. But we have found that's actually not the full story. What appears to be a single discrete lichen individual is actually consisting of multiple distinct fungal genotypes that are growing seamlessly together to form the body of the lichen. And each lichen hosts a diverse community of photosynthesizing partners that's either green algae or cyanobacteria. And in addition to that, lichens also host diverse and abundant bacterial communities and diverse communities of non-lichen fungi throughout their body. And these bacteria and non-lichen fungi, they may have uh, functions that can help the lichen or they could even be parasitic on the lichen. There's just too much we don't know about lichens yet. But because of all these different parts that seem to uh, make up a lichen, I think we need to think about lichens as miniature ecosystems or microhabitats. However, when we talk about lichens, we still refer to them as one individual organism because that's much easier. So now you know what a lichen is, but how many lichens are there globally? Well, we think there are somewhere between 13,000 and 30,000 species of lichens globally. And lichens, they're found pretty much everywhere, but they actually dominate about 8% of the Earth's surface, of the land surface, of course. And that's true in places like the tundra, where you will see carpets of lichen. All this orange, uh, yellow-green stuff you see here, that's lichens. Some forests are also dominated by lichens. You'll see trees that are festooned with lichens, Another forest where it looks like the trees have put on yellow uh, yoga pants. <laughs> then there's also a lot of uh, lichens in drylands, even though you may not uh, think, think that there would be. Uh, the Namib Desert had a, has a, an orange coating of lichens. And in the Atacama Desert, you'll find cacti that are so decorated with lichens that you can almost can't tell they're cacti. And even some subtropical fields look like they've been covered in a blanket of snow, but well, that's actually lichens. So now you can see that lichens, they really are abundant in many places. But what are lichens really good for? Well, lichens, they're pioneers that form soil and prevent erosion. Lichens, they break down rock by both physical and chemical processes. So when a lichen gets wet, it swells, and then when it dries up, it shrinks again. 
and it swells and it shrinks and it swells and it shrinks. And these repeated cycles of swelling and shrinking actually physically affects the rock and slowly break it down. And in addition to that, uh, many lichens have some very weak uh, acids in them that also work on breaking down the rock. But when I say slowly, I really mean it. It's a process that, that uh, takes place about 0 0.005 to 0 0.118 inches per year. And just for reference, 0 0.005 is about the size of a thick human hair. But even though it's slow, it's still two to 50 times faster than it would be, uh, that rock would be break down without the lichens on it. So the result is that lichens, they help release minerals and nutrients from rocks, and then they form soil. And that means that plants can eventually grow in this soil. We have a big problem in the world, and that's that about 18% of the global land area is being degraded by erosion. But soil lichens, they help stabilize and protect the soil. You can see this soil lichen is kind of holding on to the soil. And that allows the, uh, that slows down soil runoff and it helps water to infiltrate. And I'm sure Matt will talk more about that um, shortly. So you can see that lichens, they both form soil and when the soil is formed, they help hold on to it. So it doesn't just blow away. And in addition to breaking down rock and releasing nutrients that way, Lichens take, uh, also take up a lot of nutrients from the air. They have a large surface area and the surface is kind of spongy. They can accumulate much more nutrients than they actually need themselves. And that can then be available for other organisms. About 10% of all lichens, they uh, form uh, association with cyanobacteria. And as Denise told you, cyanobacteria, they can actually pull out nitrogen from the air and then uh, provide more nitrogen to the ecosystem. And here you have some of these beautiful uh, nitrogen factories, the cyanolichens as we call them. Some researchers have found that cryptogams, and cryptogams are organisms like mosses and lichens, fungi, cyanobacteria, they actually fix 54 million of nitrogen each year. And that's equivalent to 46% of all the nitrogen that's taken up globally. That's a lot of nitrogen. So lichens, they really help enrich the soil. And you probably know that uh, nitrogen is an essential nutrient for, nutrient for both plants and animals. Another essential nutrient is phosphorus. Phosphorus is in limited supply, but it's found in some rocks. And what did I just say about lichens and rocks? They break down the rocks. So lichens, they actually add phosphorus to the ecosystem and at an average of 3 billion tons of phosphorus per year. That's 60 times more phosphorus than is added by chemical fertilizers in agriculture each year globally. A lot of phosphorus. In addition to providing nutrients, lichens, they also remove CO2 from the atmosphere via photosynthesis. I'm sure you all know that plants photosynthesize, but you may not think about these tiny little organisms. They also contribute to photosynthesis. I'm going to take an example with cryptogams again. So in this case, it would mainly be mosses, lichens, and cyanobacteria like that. They take up 4 billion tons of uh, carbon each year. You may not think that sounds like a lot, but it actually removes as much carbon from the air as 860 million cars emit each year. That's three times the number of cars in the US. Lichens, they have also inspired bioengineering of materials. Some people have found, gotten the idea that they were gonna add some algae to paint. So uh, the algae would uh, remove and store CO2 that way. 
and that was inspired by lichens. So now I've shown you that lichens, they take up carbon and they also fix, some of them fix nitrogen from the air, but they also regulate air quality because they absorb pollutions that land on them. Uh, here we have a wet lichen and you can see that it's a little bit shiny and it has this spongy surface I told you about. And if we then make a section through this lichen, it'll look something like this. You can see there's an algal layer inside and the fungal, fungal uh, layers are kind of spongy. And I want you to compare that with a plant leaf where you can see water is actually beating up on the surface of the plant leaf. And that's because plants have a waxy cuticle on the surface. You might be able to see that right here. And that means that plants, they can um, pick and choose more about what they take up. So when a pollution source spews out aerosol particles, it will land on both the plant leaf and on the lichen. But because of the waxy cuticle, it's more difficult to enter the leaf, whereas the spongy uh, surface of the lichen makes it, uh, it, it makes it, it, the lichen will absorb and accumulate all these aerosols. And that uh, improves the air quality with benefits for both plants and animals. So now we've taken care of the air. Let's move on to the water because lichens, they also regulate water flow and water quality. Here, I have a time lapse. If it wants to start, it does not want to start. Why does it not want to start? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so this is a time lapse of lichens being watered. And you can see that the water fills up the inner spaces and saturates the lichen. Some lichens, they start photosynthesis when air humidity is high, but they actually dry up relatively fast again. And other lichens, they need liquid water in order to activate photosynthesis, and they can hold on to water for a long time. It's really the 3D structure of the lichen that captures raindrops more effectively and causes less runoff than naked surfaces do. And lichens, they can store th between 300 and 3,000% 3, of their dry weight in water. I want to give you an example from uh, a forest where researchers have looked at lichens on trees and they found that lichens in trees increase canopy water storage up to 38 times. That means that the forest is wet for much longer. And you probably know that uh, it takes a lot of energy for water to evaporate, and that cools down the air. That means that lichens help moderate local and regional temperatures. In addition to removing contaminants from the air, Lichens also uh, pull out contaminants of the water and hold on to them, and then uh, that improves the water quality. And that's just one of many ways that lichens can help aid uh, plant germination and growth. We've already talked about how lichens break down rock and form soil and add nutrients to the soil, but I want to give you a couple of other examples. And the first example come from Spanish moss, which actually is not a moss, nor is it a lichen. It's a bromeliad in the pineapple family. And the funny thing is that it doesn't even occur in Spain, so I don't know how it got that <laughs> name. Well, Spanish moss, establishment of sta Spanish moss was found to be sped up when these lichens were present on the oaks that they grew on. When the researchers removed the lichens, they found that uh, Spanish moss was much less likely to establish on the trees, and it took a lot longer for them to do that. And I think that's because lichens, they function as a seedbed and a nursery. Here we have another example, uh, dotlia that are nesting nicely in lichens on a vertical rock face. 
Lichens, they increase the water availability for the seed. They offer a nutrient in rich seed bag, bed and they protect the seed from herbivores. So lichens, they may protect seeds from herbivores, but they are themselves eaten by a lot of animals. There were some monkeys in China that uh, were a large part of their diet consists of lichens. Northern flying squirrels eat lichens. Gazelles in Oman eat lichens, even though it may not look like there's anything to eat in this photo. Uh, different insects eat lichens. Here it's termites chewing on a lichens. Slugs and snails eat lichens. And a lot of microscopic organisms also eat lichens. Here we have some tardigrades again. Even we humans eat lichens. A lot of different cultures have incorporated lichens in their diet. But I want to give you a specific example of an animal where lichens really are super important, and that's reindeer, same as caribou. Reindeer eat a lot of reindeer lichen, surprisingly. <laughs> it's estimated that there are 7 million reindeer in the world, and each of them eat between nine and 18 pounds of vegetation each day. In the wintertime, 90% of their diet consists of lichens. And I think it's pretty fair to say that where reindeer exist, we have winter about half the year. So I used these numbers and I calculated that totally reindeer eat up to 15 billion pounds of lichens each year. That's a lot of lichens. <laughs> but lichens, they don't just provide food for animals. They also provide shelter, habitat, camouflage, and nesting material. A lot of microfauna uh, have the habitat in lichens. Researchers had looked at one lichen individual, and they found 24 different taxa of animals with more than 4,600 individuals on one single lichen. Lichens are used as camouflage. And I want to give you some examples. Can you find the gecko in this photo? How about the lichen Katie did? Lichen moth? You see that? What's hiding in this photo? It is a lichen huntsman spider. And the body is right here in case you have a hard time seeing it. It uses lichen uh, camouflage in order to sneak up on its prey. And a totally different strategy comes from green lacewing larvae that adorns itself with lichen. It actually picks lichens and put it on its back. <laughs> and it's kind of piggy. They don't just use any lichen. Out of the 300 species of lichens that were present in this area where researchers looked, they would only use eight of these species. So maybe I need to get some green lacewing larvae to help me ID lichens. Lichens are also used as nesting material. Here we have a photo of everybody's favorite. These two little darlings were actually right outside my window in Santa Barbara during lockdown in 2020. So I watched them from eggs to fledglings. And as you can see, the, the nest is nicely decorated with lichens. So I think the mom must have known I'm a lichenologist. <laughs> You'd think I'd be done by now, but no. I have to mention that lichens produce a lot of valuable chemical compounds. There are more than 800 compounds that are unique to lichens, and they have important functions for the lichens. For example, uh, shielding them from UV light or uh, preventing herbivory. But humans have also found these compounds useful. This guy, for example, has anti-cancer effect on cells growing in a test tube. And I'm sure you're all going to appreciate this one. It's been found to have antiviral effect against the virus that causes COVID-19 and other coronaviruses. It inhibits infection by preventing replication of the virus. 
We believe that up to 50% of our lichens have antibiotic properties, and this is one of them. It had significant effect uh, against uh, all the tested bacteria. This little guy had antifungal effect on skin fungus, and this beautiful lipstick cup lichen has been found to have antioxidant effect. Researchers tested it on the enzyme that is thought to cause Alzheimer's disease and found that it actually had significant effect on that. So maybe lichens can be used to cure Alzheimer's. This guy has anti-inflammatory effects, but before you all go out and pick lichens and start eating them, I want to caution you because some of these compounds are actually poisonous. This guy, for example, has been used to kill wolves in the olden days, so don't eat lichens. Let the scientists figure out what can be used. So now you've seen a lot of the benefits that lichens provide, and I haven't even gotten into how the how the many ways that humans use lichens. Lichens are used for dyes, they're used in perfumes, they're used for air pollution monitoring and for forest health monitoring. So when lichens have so many benefits, why are they rarely considered for conservation? I think they're neglected because we simply underestimate their benefits. And of course, they're not as cute in the eyes of most people as animals with their big brown eyes, and they don't produce uh, beautiful flowers. So how can we make lichens more appealing? Maybe this will help. <laughs> well, I'll show you what I mean by lichens not being uh, very appreciated when it comes to conservation. We believe there are about at least uh, 20,000 species of lichens globally. And on the IUCN red list, there are only 69 species. That's 0.35%. How about the US? We have the, uh, the Endangered Species Act that's supposed to protect all uh, endangered species. But even though we have at least 3,600 species of lichens in the US, there are only two on the endangered species list. That's 0.06%. Well, it's got to be better in California, right? Yeah. Wrong. <laughs> we have the official endangered species list, and even though we have over 2,000 species, none of them are on uh, the endangered species list. But luckily, we also have an unofficial list where that's managed by the California Lichen Society in collaboration with the Native Plant Society. And we're working on adding species to this list. We now have 87% on this list. But I really want to draw your attention to these percentages. As you can see, they're pretty small, all of them, all of them under 1%. And then I want to see what, want you to see what happens when I change the table to reflect mammals. We have a little bit bigger percentages here, just a little bit. And I don't think that's because mammals are more threatened than lichens are. Another way of showing you this discrepancy is by showing you the effort that goes into protecting different species groups. Here I have plotted the species groups on the x-axis and the effort measured in percent dollars spent and you can see in 2020, 95% of all the money went to protect vertebrates. And only 0.004% went to lichens. Well, that's, I, I want to end up by showing you the two species that are on the uh, endangered species list. And, uh, these two species are both found on the East Coast, and they were both added to the endangered, spe endangered species list more than 20 years ago. It's the Florida perforate reindeer lichen that's only found in Florida, and the rock gnome lichen that's mainly found in the Appalachia part of Tennessee. 
And I want you to notice the, these two maps because they're the same scale. And look what happens if we move to our own backyard and look, look at a map that's the same scale. Here is a species in California that has very, very limited distribution. It's threatened by development and fires and it needs protection, but it's not protected yet. So finally, I want to say I've shown you that lichens have a lot of benefits. For example, they release 60 times more uh, phosphorus than we use in chemical fertilizers in agriculture. And they remove more CO2 than 860 million cars remove each year, emits each year, not removes. Um, they also produce compounds that might be able to cure cancer or prevent viruses. And still, they're rarely considered for conservation. So now I think that Obama is probably wondering why the lichen that's named after him, Caloplaga obame, that's endemic to Santa Rosa Island, isn't protected. And I'm sure he has the support from the lichen heads around him, because after all, lichens are nature's secret service agents. And I'll take any question that you may have. where there are fires, does the lichen have some type of regeneration since it's a rhizome? So I'm being asked if in areas with fire, if lichens have a type of regeneration, it really depends on how severe the fire is. Uh, lichens can sometimes survive uh, pretty mild fires, but if it's a severe fire, it'll take decades before the lichens come back. I am being asked if I can define a lichen species, and the answer is no. <laughs> it's, it's complicated, for sure. <laughs> um, um, let's take Bill. I'm being asked what is, would be affected, what conservation efforts would be effective. I think we need a lot more awareness of lichens. I think that would help a lot. If people knew lichens more, uh, not just uh, overlook them all the time, I think that would, that would help for sure. But legal protection would also be really important, I think. Are we done? Okay. Thank you.